Alrighty, so I'm gonna pick up from where we left off in class, and I know this thing is like painfully long, so I'm just gonna go through it pretty quick style. Alright, so a hate crime is a criminal offense against a person, property, or society, motivated by the offender's bias against race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, or ethnicity, or national origin. Um, so down here is the, at the bottom, is um, what's in your book right, the breakdown of the reported hate crimes, and um, you can see that race takes up a, almost half of those um, followed by a sexual orientation, right, at 19.6, and religion at 19. Um, right now, what's been going on um, recently, there's been a whole wave of anti-Semitic attacks on uh, Jewish cemeteries that have been destroyed, um, bomb threats that are going through, um, you know, a lot of temples and now mosques as well. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, this is a very current prevalent problem. There's been a huge uptick in hate crimes lately for some reason, meaning because the rhetoric has changed. Racism and xenophobia and all of that hatred has now moved into the forefront. The blaming, the scapegoating, that has consequences, right? It gives, it empowers people to do awful things. Like there was that guy who um, recently um, shot two uh, Indian men. Um, he was like at a bar or something and he screamed, you know, get out of my country and shot the two guys. And then later found out, cause he thought they were like Afghani. And then found out, like, oh, no, they were Indian. Like, <laughs> it's just so tragic. There's so much of this going on. I could give you, like, anecdotal, like, a thousand extra stories that have happened recently. It's just tragic in a way. Because really, once you justify that a group is not quite human, right, you, you, you basically put them lower on the hierarchy, you justify unequal treatment, that only leads to hate and violence. So 45 states and the federal government mandate additional penalties for offenses that meet the criteria of a hate crime. So meaning that, you know, you get a longer sentence if it's considered a hate crime. So many hate crimes are not reported, right, for fear of retaliation, for fear of, you know, that marginality. Um, it's very common, especially for trans people. There's been a lot of trans people murdered this year already. And um, especially trans women of color are, you know, the top of that list of how many people have died recently as a result of hate crimes. So this is a huge problem. Um, in, you know, 2012, like in your book, they talk about the stats and that's what I have down here at the bottom, your graph and the odds of being a victim. Okay. So white collar crime is illegal activities committed by people of high social position during the course of their employment or regular business activities. So meaning they're at work, they figure out a way to embezzle or make their own money um, you know, and they're more common really than people would imagine. They don't really get a lot of public attention. And as we tried to talk about, you know, when we talked about drugs and how, who the drug is associated with has everything to do with whether it's considered criminal or not. It's the same thing when it comes to crime, who's doing the crime has an impact on whether we consider it deviant. Since we consider street crime to be scary, you know, meaning they're poor people, a marginalized group, people of color, marginalized group, right, um, that are stereotyped as being, you know, you know, different or, or, or just deviant, right, versus white collar people, that's the people that we celebrate in society, right, rich folks, rich white people that make a lot of money, like, that's what we're taught to want to be in society, so when they commit a crime, it's not considered bad in the same way, so it doesn't really get public attention, and so the cases are usually heard in a civil court, and if they're convicted, they rarely go to jail. These people, you know, embezzle crazy amounts of money, or go bankrupt to get their own golden parachutes, and the taxpayers, the rest of us, you and me, are the ones that have to pay for it. So corporate crime is an unlawful act committed by a corporation or persons acting on its behalf. So one example of that would be gross negligence, which is when you know a product is faulty or dangerous, but you do it anyway, like the tobacco companies, right? We know now from release documents from that time period, they knew as soon as the 1950s that it caused cancer and there was problems with that or 
you know, um, look at Rex Tillerson, <laughs> right? The new Secretary of State. Somehow I'm saying that, and that just still blows my mind. Um, former, I guess, kind of former CEO of Exxon Mobil, <sighs> who, um, you know, Exxon was known for in the '70s, being one of the first to realize that global warming was a phenomenon that was happening, that climate change was being spurned on by the burning of fossil fuels. And they saw this was a good development because that meant that the ice in the Arctic would melt and they would be able to get to new sources of oil. They, instead of doing anything about it, they purposely started paying millions of dollars to fund fake science to counter the real science that shows that they were making a detrimental impact. So that would be an example of gross negligence, right? You know, your gasoline is murdering the planet. So you spend 40 years funding disinformation, right? So anyway, the cost of white collar crime and corporate crime is far greater than the cost of all property crimes in a year. But it's because we consider these people to be privileged, we don't consider them deviant, right? So I'm going to show you this clip about why it is that corporate criminals get away with it when other people don't. Music by Godspeed You, Black Emperor. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to the felons on Wall Street. Five of the world's top banks will pay over $5 billion in fines after pleading guilty to rigging the price of foreign currencies and interest rates. Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, Barclays and Royal Bank of Scotland pleaded guilty to conspiring to manipulate the price of U.S. dollars and euros exchanged in the $5 trillion foreign exchange, $5 trillion foreign exchange spot market. UBS pleaded guilty for its role in manipulating the LIBOR benchmark interest rate. On Wednesday, U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch announced the deal. We are here to announce a major law enforcement action against international financial institutions that for years participated in a brazen display of collusion and foreign exchange rate market manipulation and will, as a result, pay a total of nearly $3 billion in fines and penalties. As a result of our investigation, four of the world's largest banks have agreed to plead guilty to felony antitrust violations. They are Citicorp. J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, Barclays PLC, and the Royal Bank of Scotland PLC. No one who works with the bank was hit with criminal charges as part of the settlements. For more, we're joined by Matt Taibbi, award-winning journalist with Rolling Stone magazine. His most recent book, The Divide, American Injustice in the Age of the Wealth Gap, is now out in paperback. We'll come back to democracy now, Matt. Okay. See you, Amy. Explain what these banks are charged with and what does it mean when you say banks are charged but all the people go free? Right. They filed, uh, actually, these banks, the companies pleaded guilty to felony charges in this case, which means it was not individuals at the company, it was the actual company itself, which is actually a step forward because uh, for a long time in the post-2008 period, we were having a lot of settlements where there was a sort of neither admit nor deny uh, um, agreement between the government and these companies. And in this case, they actually did have to admit to wrongdoing and did have to plead guilty to a criminal charge in addition to the money-changing hands. And what was the wrongdoing? The wrongdoing was, was manipulating the prices of currencies, which uh, is about as serious a financial crime as you can possibly get. I think, you know, you, you and I sat here a few years ago and talked about the LIBOR scandal. Um, this is very similar. Uh, In as simple terms as you can make it, because I think that's why nobody goes to jail. No one can—you can, can right. understand if someone steals a candy bar, right. and a person can go to jail for years for that. Right. But when it comes to this, what did they do? They were monkeying around with the prices of every currency on Earth. So if you can imagine that anybody who has money, which basically includes anybody who's breathing on the planet, um, all of those people were affected by this activity. So if you have dollars in your pocket, um, they were mon monkeying around with the prices of dollars versus euros. So you might have had more or less money fractionally, uh, depending on uh, all of this manipulation every single day. And again, uh, Attorney General Lynch uh, went out of her way to say that this activity went on basically every single day for the last five years or so. So every single day, that five dollars in your pocket was worth a little bit more or a little bit less uh, based on what these people were doing. 
And if you spread that out to everybody on Earth, it turns into a, a, a financial crime that's on a scale that, you know, you would normally only think of in Bond movies or something like that. Hmm. Well, the Justice Department says traders used online chat rooms and coded language to manipulate currency exchange rates. One high-ranking Barclays trader chatted, quote, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. And another responded, quote, yes, the less competition, the better. So could you comment on that, Matt, and also explain why, in this particular case, the companies pleaded guilty? Well, I think part of it is because they had this very graphic uh, online record of, of these people chatting and admitting to essentially a criminal conspiracy in writing. Uh, that's one of the things that's really interesting about this entire uh, era of financial crime is that you have so much of this very graphic, detailed documentary evidence just lying around. The problem is the government has either been too overwhelmed or, or too disinclined to go and get it and do anything with it. In this case, you have people openly calling themselves the cartel or the mafia, and then openly talking about m monkeying around or manipulating uh, you know, the price of this or that. Um, the, the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, actually released uh, chats from a different case involving interest rate swaps yesterday where, they, where one guy was bragging about how he was he was uh, holding up the, the price of interest rate swaps like he was bench pressing it. Uh, they were bragging about this, uh, uh, you know, in these chat rooms. So these, what you have to understand about these, a lot of these people, they're very testosterone laden, souped up young people uh, who think that they're indestructible, they're very arrogant, and they're doing all this in, in chat rooms thinking they're never going to get caught, and they got caught. On Wednesday, Citigroup CEO Michael Corbett said, quote, the behavior that resulted in the settlements we announced today is an embarrassment to our firm and stands in stark contrast to Citi's values, unquote. Meanwhile, J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon called the investigation findings, quote, a great disappointment to us. He went on to say, quote, the lesson here is that the conduct of a small group of employees or of even a single employee can reflect badly on all of us and have significant ramifications for the entire firm, said the CEO, Jamie Dimon. Well, what's humorous about this is that uh, uh, virtually all of these so-called too-big-to-fail banks now have been embroiled in, in scandals of varying degrees of extreme seriousness since 2008. So for them to say, oh, it's just a few bad apples in this one instance is increasingly absurd. They've been dinged for, for everything from bribery to money laundering to rigging LIBOR to um, mass fraud in the subprime mortgage markets and now currency, the Forex markets. Uh, it's one mass crime over, uh, you know, after another, and there's no comment. Now, aren't these banks competitors? Well, sort of, but that's the main problem in this case is what's happening is that they're colluding, which is a far more dangerous kind of corruption than what we saw, for instance, in 2008, when you saw a lot of banks in-house committing fraud, uh, you know, against their own clients and against the markets. This behavior, where you have a series of major banks colluding to fix the price uh, of a currency, um, that is extremely dangerous. And if, if that behavior is allowed to go unchecked, the negative possibilities that could stem from that are, are virtually, uh, you know, limitless. Well, the, uh, the foreign exchange market is the largest and yet the least regulated market in the financial world. Mm -hmm. Do you know why that is, and who would be in charge of its regulation? Well, a variety of regulatory bodies would have what you would describe as a general purview over this kind of activity. Obviously, they got them on an antitrust violation, so this it falls under the purview of the Department of Justice. Um, the Fed, the banking regulators, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, they all have a kind of a general mandate to look out for this sort of stuff. But the problem with the Forex markets is that there isn't a specific body that's specifically looking at this all the time. It's not like, um, let's say, you know, uh, the commodities market, where you do have the CFTC that's specifically looking at that. Um, this is one of many markets that uh, simply falls between the cracks uh, in, the, in the regulatory scheme, where there, there isn't a single, uh, you know, a targeted effort to look at this all the time. Earlier this month, independent Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, who's now running for president, introduced the Too Big to Fail, Too Big to Exist Act. The bill that I am introducing today with Congressman Brad Sherman would require regulators at the Financial Stability Oversight Council to establish too big to fail list of too big to fail list of financial institutions and other huge entities 
whose failure would pose a catastrophic risk on the United States economy without a taxpayer bailout. This list must include, but is not limited to, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, and Morgan Stanley. It should make every American extremely nervous that in this weak regulatory environment, weak regulatory environment, the financial supervisors in our country and around the world are still able to uncover an enormous amount of fraud on Wall Street and other financial institutions to this very day. I fear very much that the financial system is even more fragile than many people may perceive. This huge issue simply cannot be swept under the rug. It has got to be addressed. So that is Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders, senator of Vermont, independent senator. Uh, about a decade ago, mm -hmm. you uh, stayed with Sanders for about a month, covering mm -hmm. him for Rolling Stone, doing a profile. Yeah, sort of remarkably, he, he uh, invited me to tag along and just sort of watch how the process works. I think he... He felt that the public uh, should know about a lot of the nooks and crannies of the congressional bureaucracy. Uh, and I got this remarkable education into how things actually work. He didn't hold anything back. Um, Sanders is, you know, exactly as advertised. He's a completely honest, I think, politician who is just really interested in seeing you know, uh, standing up for regular working people. So his voice on this on this particular issue, I think, is really important because he's one of the few politicians who understands that it's it's a truly bipartisan situ issue that affects everybody, people on both sides of the aisle equally. Uh, and he's absolutely right about breaking up the banks. That is the single most important thing that that has to be done uh, with this issue. All right, organized crime and victimless crime. So organized crime is a business operation that supplies illegal goods and services such as gambling, sex, or drugs. So organized crime, typically people think of like the mob, <laughs> right? That'd be an example. And organized crime is something that's become very multinational, right? This isn't something that's just geographically bound to one nation or another. You know, when you're talking about like, let's say the drug cartels in Mexico, the drug cartels aren't landlocked necessarily completely to Mexico. Where are they getting their money? Is it all coming from Mexico? No, it's coming from the U.S., right? Like, we are a huge drug market. Our demand is what funds the cartels. So, you know, it's kind of showing that organized crime, it definitely spans across continents and across, you know, country border lines. Um, and victimless crime refers to offenses that directly harm no one but the person who commits them. So they can and do cause harm. So these could be things like gambling or prostitution. Like if you're gambling, that causes you harm for sure, right? Like you could lose all your money, but that doesn't necessarily hurt other people, right? So that's kind of how that's defined. All right, violence. So violence is behavior that causes injury to people or damages property. It becomes a social problem to the extent that people define it that way. So how do we end up even defining it that way? We look at these four things. What do the actors intend by their actions? Does the violence conform to or violate the social norms and values, right? Like the idea that we allow violence to happen in certain contexts as normal. So like at, down at the bottom here, there's men grappling and crumbling and crashing into each other, but that's normative, right? Why? Because it's considered a sport. Right? So it depends on are you tackling a random person on the street? Or are you tackling a person while you're playing a football game? Right? That's going to make a big difference when it comes to if it conforms to the social norms and values. Does the violence support or threaten the social order? Right? Is the, is the football something that supports basically the social order that gets people to, you know, go eat, at their, go eat some wings and drink some beer and <laughs> support their capitalist society? Or does it threaten the social order, right? It's like, no, they're like more, you know, dissident, violent acts like aggravated assaults or things like that would, right? So is violence committed by or against the government, right? That's a huge one in whether or not we consider something to be violence. The government commits all sorts of violence, state violence, right? But we typically see individual actors as the worst part, right? We don't typically look at, like, like when we talk about terrorism, we're typically looking at an individual trying to go against the government, right? But we often don't look at what's called state terrorism, right? The fact that, you know, as a colonial imperialist power, the U.S. has gone into 
you know, all sorts of countries all over the world. Actually, right now, um, you know, since Trump took office, there's been more um, drone and aerial bombing campaigns since, like, more so than all of the last year of the Obama campaign. In like, or I mean, a oh, campaign, Obama year, basically in office, his last year in office. Um, so meaning within like two months, there's been already more um, operations than there were throughout that whole year when it comes to um, violence happening to other people on behalf of our government, right? Like I remember Donald Trump was quoted as saying when they asked him, what are you going to do with ISIS? He said, bomb the shit out of them. And that's what he's doing. But when he says them, that's a pretty loose criteria. And oftentimes, um, you know, like the successful raid he was talking about. <sighs> Sorry, I'll, try, I'll stop talking about it soon. Um, <laughs> that successful raid that, you know, happened. Um, they don't talk about how many children were killed in that. There was like 13 kids killed in that successful raid, right? Um, one of which was an American citizen, seven years old, the cutest kid in life. Um, it's just, yeah, anyway, oh God, when it's, when it's committed by the government, it tends to be justified. It tends to be cloaked in a, in a thing of, oh, well, we need it for protection. It's for national defense. It's blah, blah, blah. But when you're flying like a, uh, a pilotless weapon into a place and blowing up, you know, a wedding or blowing up a religious service, because one person in there might have an affiliation with something else, you're not necessarily, you know, that's not necessarily thoughtful military decisions. That's state terrorism. So anyway, who does it makes a big difference in what we determine as. All right. So institutional violence is violence carried out by the government, representatives under the law, and is obviously widely supported. So this is why um, you can kill a person in war and it's not considered murder. Right. Or, um, you know, the, the kind of issue that we have right now where police are shooting a lot of unarmed um, African-Americans in the streets of the U.S. Um, because it's, uh, you know, carried out by someone that has a badge and a gun, um, it's justified in a way that obviously it wouldn't be if there was just vigilantes like during the KKK era where uh, lynch mobs would go around the streets and just collect African-Americans and beat them to death and hang them from trees. Um, you know, that's obviously not the same, but because it's being carried out through a government representative, it's not considered a huge problem. So people are quick to condemn anti-institutional violence, so violence directed at the government in violation of law. Obviously, violence is bad. Like, that's kind of obviously, like, I feel like I have to disclaimer that, which is really sad, right? Like, obviously, violence is bad. But the idea is when you're looking at something like that sociologically, you can't parse out the difference. You still need to look at how not just anti-institutional violence works, but how is institutional violence not just often supporting, but often causing that anti-institutional violence to happen, right? It's this idea that like uh, when Obama was in office, he said he wouldn't say that, uh, you know, uh, what was it? Radical Islam or whatever. Um, because the whole point is the people that are ISIS, ISIL, whatever you want to call them, they call themselves the Islamic State. They don't get to just be wingnuts that say, we represent Islam. There's like millions of other people that believe in Islam that believe in like what it actually stands for. Like, which is like every other Judeo-Christian thing that you don't kill people, you know, that you like respect other people and all that kind of stuff. Um, so for them to kind of say like, oh no, they represent Islam, Obama didn't want to buy into that. He didn't want to, you know, put fuel on that fire. But like Trump loves throwing fuel on the fire. And a lot of people have said that this, these um, quote unquote Muslim bans, these restrictive orders that he's put in place to try and bar people coming into the country from certain specific countries around the world have done nothing but been a recruitment tool for anti-institutional violence because it's basically just saying to people, you know, it's basically giving giving would-be terrorists ammunition to say, see, the United States hates you. They're against you. They don't care if you live or die, right? So in a lot of ways, it's become kind of a benefit for anti-institutional violence the more that institutional violence takes place. All right, serious violence. So mass murder is the intentional unlawful killing of former people at one time or place. 
Um, this often occurs in schools, businesses, homes, where people assume they're safe from violence. Oh, man. So, like, there's just, it feels like I could never keep up statistics-wise with this stuff. Like, every time I have something down for my notes, it's always too old by the time I lecture again. It's really startling how often these things take place in this country. Um, and, you know, as we talked about with uh, Jackson Katz clip in Chapter 4, when we talk about gender, um, you know, most mass murderers are men, right? There is this link between being disrespected and using violence or men being dejected and committing mass murders, like, right? It's typically someone snaps. They have a high-stress episode, like they... They lose their job, they lose their spouse, they lose something very vitally important to their identity, and they feel that they've been lost in their masculinity as a human, and they feel that the only way to gain that power back is by murdering a bunch of people, right? Like the Virginia Tech guy is a good example of that, or that a-hole at uh, UCSB, I can't remember his name. Oh, that piece of crap that like recorded the thing before he went in talking about how he was going to murder all the bitches that didn't want to that didn't care about him or, you know, didn't want to date him. Oh, that guy's a piece of crap. Um, Elliot Roger. There we go. Anyway, not that you need to know these people's names. But it's just the idea that that there's a kind of a really interesting cultural and gendered aspect to that as well, right? Like, when they're white people, we tend to be like, wow, you know, they must be mentally ill or this is a single incident. But when a person's a person of color or something of that nature, that becomes the focus of that story or of that, you know, investigation or scope or that tends to, you know, like with the Boston bombers, right? As soon as they had any idea that these people might be not, you know, like have any sort of like like Eastern European slash Middle Eastern heritage of any kind, it was like, yes, they were, the media immediately jumped on that. And that became the story. So, you know, it's interesting how um, a lot of these mass murders, though, are pretty much domestic terrorists. They're just typically people that snap. And then um, often you'll see in a situation of a mass murder, very interestingly, um, the first person they're going to kill is the one that's like the closest. So, like, that one dude, Adam something, that killed all those kids at Newtown, right? Who did he kill first? He killed his mom, right? He killed his mom at home, and then he went there and killed all those children and teachers and whatever. So, anyway, um, you know, it is linked to other issues in our society, especially masculinity and, and, you know, power. Serial murder is the killing of several people by one offender over a period of time. So, that would be more like... The Zodiac Killer, something I'm fascinated by. <laughs> Just, it's a little weird hobby of mine. Because um, I, like, think I figured out who it was. But anyway, it doesn't matter. But um, basically, that's, like, somebody that they don't, they're not killing, like, a bunch of people in one incident in one place. It's not, like, a Aurora thing or, like, a Newtown thing. Serial murder is more, you know, the, the Ted Bundys, the, you know, the Ed Geens, the, you know, um... Like, out here we had Richard Ramirez, right? Or probably, like, the most famous would be, like, Jack the Ripper, right? There's a lot of them. There's, like, Pachuskin, um, like, internationally, right? Who's this really interesting Russian serial killer? Um, or even Andre, um, I can't remember his last name. Never mind. Another Russian one. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So basically, <laughs> these um, serial killers are very they're they're fascinating they're they're very very rare right um typically they develop this thing over time a lot of them have incidents of violence or you know really traumatic incidents in their own childhoods or things of that nature um you know it's interesting that a lot of them um once they are caught they end up confessing to a lot more than um than what they were caught for. So, like, for example, the BTK murderer, uh, well, they called him BTK because uh, bind, torture, and kill. That was his technique. Um, he was gone for a lot of years. He basically killed a bunch of people in Kansas, but, like, when it, you know, there's windows of time where he just did nothing. So, um, you know, it's interesting, like, once they caught him, he confessed to a bunch of ones they didn't even know he did. So it's, it's like, part of it, for some of these people is about the 
the kill itself, but part of it is about getting away with it. Like the Zodiac killer taunted the police. He would send them letters and clues and pieces of clothing and things like that just to taunt them. But of course, that was in a time period where we didn't have surveillance cameras everywhere or, or advanced DNA techniques. I think nowadays Zodiac wouldn't have been able to get away with what he got away with. But anyway, um, it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, we do tend to have a lot more of them in our culture. And I do think that has a lot more to do with the focus on violence within our culture and the fact that we have a very individualistic mindset that leads a lot of people to be marginalized so that they're easy pickings for serial killers. All right. So the mass media, obviously, um, you know, most researchers, most researchers, researchers <laughs> agree that watching violence can encourage you to be more violent and desensitize you to violence. So the fact that we have more and more and more realistic, like I put in this picture from your book of Walking Dead. I mean, this is obviously a few seasons back because there's Herschel and he's walking. But anyway, um, I love that show. And I think it's an important thing to mention here anyway. You can still love what a media system does or is. Like, I can love Walking Dead. But I can also be critical of how the extreme violence really normalizes this sense of, you know, killing and maiming and things in a real interesting way. Like, for myself, I'm an adult. <laughs> I consent to watching these things. But I remember, um, you know, a couple years back, I was tutoring this kid and she was watching, um, it's before Walking Dead, but she was watching like horror movies with her dad at like five, six years old, things that were like the, akin to Walking Dead, like very graphically, violently, whatever. And I, you know, kind of thought that was interesting because I talked to her about it and I told her, well, like, why don't you tell your dad that you're not comfortable watching it? You know, like, why do you feel like you have to do it? You know, because she was basically saying, well, she thought being a grown up, part of being an adult was not flinching when someone died, like watching someone die. And that struck me as creep, not just creepy as hell, but like really messed up. But she's learning this message that like, yeah, to be an adult is to see acts of violence and be like, yep, that's entertainment. And so in a lot of ways, this is very interesting how much research is found. Not only does it encourage us, but it desensitizes us. We don't see real violence as as much of a problem if we see like fake violence all the time. So youth gangs are groups of young people who identify with one another and with a particular territory. So youth gangs can be nonviolent gangs. They can be those who clash over turf. They could be all out criminal organizations. There's a lot of different variations, right, of these youth gangs. So typical violent gang members are coming from poor single parent families, just meaning that they're more marginalized. They have less support. They have less people looking out for them. They have more opportunities of free time and unsupervised time. Because think about it. If you have a single parent and they're working all the time, then who's there to check up on you? If you don't have like a larger social system or safety net, like, like a group of people that you know, extended family or maybe like community center or things within your neighborhood that are supporting you, then you're more likely to get pulled into the world of the street. So a lot of these kids are from neighborhoods characterized by high crime rates, drug abuse, and limited job opportunities. So the violent gang offers them not just a family and protection from the violence in that neighborhood, but also a financial opportunity to get ahead, which they're not getting from the neighborhood. So this is a big, larger structural problem. If we didn't have these structural issues of poverty, we wouldn't be motivating kids to join gangs for their own safety and survival and financial security. So obviously drugs contribute to violence by distorting judgment and reducing people's inhibitions. So some drugs are addictive and cause cravings that are so strong that people may turn violent in search for their next high, right? So there is an interesting relationship between drugs and violence because if it's not just this, this kind of one direction of someone on drugs committing violence, it's also the idea that, you know, the, the drug game, the drug world itself often uses a lot of violence in order to keep its peace, right? Um, to establish power and connections and those things. So, you know, um, if people are living in low-income communities that are plagued by drugs, they're also going to be dealing with the violence and crime that goes around that. Um, so many people blame the problem of crime on the easy availability of guns. So 34% of households have at least one gun. And 37% of these weapons are handguns. Um, I think we talked about this in class a little bit. The thing that freaks me out are the militias, the people that are 
like slowly stockpiling all over this country these crazy white militias they have a ridiculous amount of guns um, gun violence is the leading cause of death for African American Latino males age 15 to 34 so clearly this is a problem when it comes to at least the lives and opportunities of those men when it comes to guns and violence there's different approaches um, from different groups so liberals argue that you should restrict the availability of handguns require trigger locks and ban military style assault rifles um, it's really interesting they have this new thing now called uh, smart guns which I think are cool where basically like you know if you want to get into your iPhone you can put your thumb on the pad right it's the same kind of thing but with your gun meaning that it would only be attuned to you and so there's been uh, talk about using this in law enforcement because think about the practical applications of using that in law enforcement. How fascinating is that? If no one could use your gun but you, then it means you as an officer don't have to fear being disarmed by another person because they can't use their they can't use your gun against you, right? Like that's just almost like an extra safety precaution. Plus, think about how many unnecessary household deaths that could present that could prevent. So many kids die every year because they get access to the gun in the house. It's not locked up safely. The bullets are in the gun. They're not separately kept in the way that they're supposed to be. And kids end up either playing with it, showing it to other people, and end up sometimes hurting themselves, hurting their parents, hurting others. And uh, that wouldn't happen if you had that smart gun because the kid wouldn't be able to fire it because they wouldn't have the right fingerprint signature. So anyway, I think it's interesting how technology could do that, but then the NRA is super against those smart guns, which is dumb because you're like, it's still guns and they're still going to make money. And it's also like the safety it could provide for families and for police is just like too good. But they're like, any restriction on guns is terrible. Everyone should be constantly covered in guns. And you're like, yeah, whatever. So speaking of conservatives, um, they stand by the constitutional quote, Right to keep and bear arms. Oh, I could go into that all day. All day I could go into that, how the actual Constitution says that an organized militia would do that. And that the amendment itself, Second Amendment, doesn't necessarily mean we get to own guns. Right? That was actually an interpretation that started taking root in the early 1970s. <laughs> so, anyway, we'll talk about that later, too, when we talk about, you know, the kind of uh, political system. So, anyway... Um, widespread gun ownership may help reduce crime by deterring would-be criminals is their argument, right? So I'm going to show you a couple of these clips here. The first about uh, the banning of military assault rifles and the next about the claim that if more people own guns, that would reduce crime. So let me put those videos in here right there. Now to Portland, Oregon, where we're joined by Jennifer Lynch from the Oregon Alliance for Gun Safety. The group includes more than 50 organizations that push for the passage of Oregon's new Firearm Safety Act, which expands background checks and gun sales in Oregon. It was signed into law in May. Jennifer Lynch, welcome to Democracy Now! First of all, talk about the reaction in the community to this horrific killing, the massacre that took place yesterday at Umpqua Community College. Well, well of course. The reaction is always horror, but frankly, never surprise. These things happen entirely too often. It always feels like they could happen close to home. Um, and this time, it was our turn. And it was especially ironic that this occurs only uh, a, f a couple of months after you had a, a new laws for background checks uh, in. Uh, uh, in Oregon. Could you talk about your campaign there? That's right. So, for the third time in three years, the Oregon legislature considered a bill expanding a background check on uh, the uh, sale of firearms to include every firearm sale. That includes private sales between two individuals, including two individuals who met online. This is a bill that uh, gun violence prevention organizations in Oregon have been campaigning for since 2013, um, and we were met with resistance in the 2013 and 2014 state legislative sessions. And so, as such, we worked to change the state legislature. This year, the bill was reintroduced uh, and was able to pass both chambers. It was signed into law by the governor this May. And can you talk about so, the chief sponsor of the law, his significance? 
Yeah, uh, Senator Floyd Prozanski of Eugene, Oregon, is the chief sponsor of that bill and has carried it for the last three legislative sessions. Senator Prozanski himself has been touched by gun violence. He is a longtime gun owner and a, uh, a hunter and protective of Second Amendment rights, but also believes this is one small thing that we can do to make Oregon's communities safer, and there simply is no excuse for inaction at this point. And I wanted to ask you about uh, John Hanlon, the sheriff of Douglas County, who is leading the investigation. Uh, I want to turn to a clip of his. Uh, he is in the lead in the investigation into the shooting of Umpqua Community College. But in April, as the Oregon State Legislature held hearings for new legislation to expand background checks uh, to private gun sales, Hanlon testified against the measure. This law is not going to protect citizens of Oregon in that it is going to keep guns out of the hands of criminals. It will not do that. We have laws that prohibit the possession of other things, like methamphetamine, and it, and it doesn't stop it. What I fear most is that we are going to create criminals, and specifically felonous criminals, out of some of our most ordinary, uh, normal, law-abiding citizens. Furthermore, I don't know how I can, at least in my county, begin to try to enforce this law. Um, being a timber harvest dependent county such as we are, um, our budget is, con is continuously shrinking to the point that there are times when we have a difficult time simply responding to domestic disturbances, vehicle crashes, the ordinary calls for service that happen every day. Um, and to expect local law enforcement to run down and, and, and do an investigation um, into whether or not an individual, a private individual, has conducted a background check is, is nearly impossible. Um, uh, I, I urge you to consider this bill closely and, and to not pass it. it. It simply isn't going to work for us. That was Douglas County Sheriff John Hanlon uh, earlier this year. But in 2013, uh, and remember, he's the person now investigating the shooting at Umpqua Community College, he wrote a letter to Vice President Joe Biden. In the letter, he asked the vice president not to tamper with the Second Amendment, writing, quote, gun control is not the answer to preventing heinous crimes like school shootings. Any actions against or in disregard for our U.S. Constitution and Second Amendment rights by the current administration would be irresponsible responsible and an indisputable insult to the American people. He goes on to say, quote, I will not violate my constitutional oath. Therefore, the second purpose of this letter is to make notification that any federal regulation enacted by Congress or by executive order of the president offending the constitutional rights of, of my citizens shall not be enforced by me or by my deputies, nor will I permit the enforcement of any unconstitutional regulations or orders by federal officers within the border of Douglas County, Oregon. Uh, your response to the sheriff uh, and his stands in the past on this issue of greater uh, uh, or more expanded gun control? Sheriff Hanlon forgets that uh, common sense and reasonable, moderate gun safety regulations have, in fact, been held up as constitutional, first of all, repeatedly. Uh, and secondly, he forgets that, as a you know, law enforcement officer, his first duty is to protect the people of Douglas County, not to advance his own political agenda or his own interpretation of what the Second Amendment does and does not allow for. Uh, the true insult to the people of Douglas County is that they were victims of a horrendous mass shooting on the campus of a public institution. And that, truly, is where his attention should be focused today. How did a young man accumulate so many weapons and so much ammunition? How was he able to carry it unnoticed into classrooms and open fire, taking the lives of classmates, innocent bystanders? Truly, this, this is the insult that has been forced upon us. And, and this is where I would ask that his attention lie in the days and weeks ahead. All right, so society's use of due process involving police courts and punishment to enforce the law is the criminal justice system. 
So due process is just the criminal justice system operating within the bounds of law, meaning that the Constitution outlines, you know, what is acceptable, what's expected, right? So meaning that you have a speedy trial, that you have the right to counsel, that you have the right to a jury of your peers, like all of those kind of things that are established um, are what is considered due process when that actually plays out. So police make choices about what warrants their attention in their everyday work, right? And so Smith and Weischer in your book found the following factor to guide police and arrest decisions. So how serious is the crime, right? Like if you're loitering or drinking in public and it's not a big deal and they can just kind of like, okay, throw this away, whatever, and they don't want to do the paperwork, you know, that's going to be different. But if they hear someone screaming because they think that like, probable cause, like someone's getting murdered at that point, like obviously the seriousness is different. Um, so what does the victim want, right? Is the victim trying to protect themselves? Are they defending themselves against an attacker? Like that makes a difference, right? Um, does the victim, is the victim trying to, to do something bad to them, to the, to the offender, right? Like it's important to understand the context. Um, is the suspect being cooperative, right? Um, does the suspect have a record? Is this something that they've already done before? Is there like a pattern of this problem happening? Are there bystanders watching? Did they understand, you know, what's happening? Do they have any input on what was happening from like an outsider perspective that doesn't, isn't colored by the victim or the offender? And what's the suspect's race? Unfortunately, even though that's number six, that tends to be higher up in the determination of what factors guide police and arrest decisions, right? Because part of it is that how serious is the crime, right? That kind of context of like how criminal is the individual is often kind of understood and mitigated through the understanding of race or ethnicity. So when it comes to the courts, 97% of criminal cases are settled through plea bargaining, right? Most of the time, um, you know, we think of that, oh, everyone's going to court and they have a trial, but the overwhelming, overwhelming majority, 97% of the time, it's plea bargains, right? And um, in my criminology class, we explain, we get into the depth about why that is, right? How, how it um, has everything to do with what's called overclocking or overcharging, meaning that um, a lot of DAs will say they'll charge you like three, four additional things that they know they can't actually get you with in court. But then you'll be like, okay, I'll plead out to this because I don't want to get a mandatory minimum or I don't want to hit a certain federal guideline and get a, a harsher sentence. So people will plead out usually to a, to a um, lesser offense um, in order for a reduced sentence, right? But plea bargaining, uh, relying too heavily on it, can take away a defendant's constitutional right to a trial because they might just take the plea so they can get out of jail, but that doesn't mean that they were guilty. Right? It just means that they don't think that they have an opportunity to a fair trial. So again, this has a lot to do with social class and race because it's like social class wise, if you have money and you know you're innocent, you're going to court. You're going to get a good lawyer. You're going to do that whole thing. If you're innocent and you're a poor person that's swept up into the system, guess what you're going to do? You're often going to take the plea bargain. You're not going to understand that often you're taking a felony charge and that means that you're then not eligible for food stamps, most public assistance, public housing, all of those kind of things, um, you know, financial aid, those kind of things, um, which is a huge thing to not know um, when you just are basically like, hey, uh, they'll figure it out eventually that I'm innocent. I just need to get out of jail to take care of my kids, right? So plea bargaining, um, you know, relying too much on it has really kind of led to part of the issue that we're having right now with the overburdened criminal justice system. So... In 2012, more than 2.3 million people were incarcerated in the U.S., which is almost five times the number in 1980. So the U.S. imprisons a larger share of its population than any other country in the world. We're number one in incarceration. It's never anything, anything good. <laughs> it's never like in math or science. It's always like in fat people, in incarceration. Anyway, um, so justifications there are always going to be justifications for society to punish wrongdoers. So the first is called retribution, which is basically revenge, right? It's moral vengeance by which society inflicts on the offender suffering comparable to that caused by the offense, right? So it's like revenge as a punishment, basically. Deterrence is using punishment to discourage further crimes, right? So saying like, okay, you're a kid, you do something stupid, you get X amount of 
hours of community service and that's supposed to deter you, meaning in the future, you'll be like, I don't want to have to do that again. It's not worth it. You know, and then the idea is there's something that they call, and again, in CRIM, I talk about this a lot, what they call specific deterrence and general deterrence, meaning specific deterrence is if I get sentenced with a year in jail, I won't want to do that thing again that got me a year in jail, right? But the general deterrence is like if I am, you know, if I get sentenced to something and my friends and family see that, they're less likely to do it. So like if you stole a car and, or like if you see your friends steal a car, and they get like a month in jail, or if you see them steal a car and they get 10 years in jail, that's going to be a different general deterrent effect on you. Anyway, um, rehabilitation is what we claim to do, <laughs> which is reforming an offender to prevent future offenses, right? There are some actual programs that are rehabilitative in our current criminal justice system where they'll have, um, you know, restorative justice stuff where people try and atone for the things that they've done to their community and to the lives of others, um, you know, or they'll give them skills training or college degree training or things of that nature so that people have an education and a livelihood that they can have once they get out, then they're way less likely to recidivize, which means go back to jail within a short period of time of getting out. Um, and then the last one is societal protection, this idea that you have to protect the public by using incarceration or execution to prevent an offender from committing further offenses. And that's kind of what we've done with these mandatory minimums and these three strike laws, right? It's just like, make society safe, lock all these bad guys up, right? But without really looking at the context of like, well, why did they do what they did and how and why and what situations and choices that they have? So does punishment work? There's an increasing criticism of mass incarceration because of the unprecedented number of people behind bars, right? Conservatives are concerned about the high cost of it, and liberals are concerned about the violence of the prison life, right? The fact that if, uh, if all these men of color are getting swept up in the system, that breaks up families. That means that fathers are not home to take care of their kids. They're not there for their wives, right? They're not there in their communities, in those support roles, they're not there to financially support for their families. So that affects those families and communities a lot, right? And they also argue that there's this issue of targeting minorities. A lot of uh, policing is now geographic, meaning it's something they call hotspot policing, right? Where instead of necessarily looking at a crime or an issue and having like a, a certain amount of probable cause, oftentimes it's more of a fish in the barrel going to areas that are low income areas where there's visible street crime and then just kind of setting up a net and trying to pull everyone into it. Like an example of that would be the stop and frisk policies that were very popular in New York for a lot of years that, um, you know, they found that had a ridiculously low success rate. You know, the overwhelming majority of those who were stopped were people of color and the 98% of those people who were stopped and harassed and searched and hassled weren't doing anything wrong, had no intent of anything wrong, and had nothing on them of any illegal substance or anything of that nature either. So yeah, they're basically saying that targets minorities, that disengenders a relationship with the police, and it just causes tension and problems within communities of color versus the police. So I kind of mentioned restorative justice a minute ago. Restorative justice is a response to crime, seeking to restore the well-being of the victim, offender, and the larger community loss due to crime, right? So trying to make up for what you did, but help your community in the same time. So correctional programs located in society as a whole, rather than behind prison walls, um, you know, oftentimes that can help a lot, like uh, probation or parole or those kind of things that gives people the opportunity to kind of get back into society, potentially like you know, kind of get back into their communities. But um, again, they're under corrective control, so they don't have the same rights as a lot of us. They are, you know, disenfranchised from voting. They often can't get access to, if they have a felony, any of those kind of public social services again. Um, so, you know, when it really comes down to it, criminals are the one group in society we're allowed to hate. So no one's out there advocating necessarily, well, there are people out there that are doing it, but you don't see a lot of politicians out there advocating on behalf of criminals because it just would be bad rhetoric for their elections. A lot of the problems we have with the overburdening of the criminal justice system right now and how many people are locked up behind bars is actually a result of political, you know, commentary of the 80s and 90s of saying, no, I'm more tough on crime. No, I'm more tough on crime. I'm more tough than you are. No, I'm more tough than you. And creating more and more laws and mandatory minimums and three strikes and these things to try and 
prove to each other to get reelected that they're tough on crime. But really what they ended up doing was causing a lot more damage. All right, so the death penalty. Um, 18 states have abolished the death penalty and six have done so since 2006. Uh, between 97 or 1977 and 2014, more than 8,000 people were sentenced to death. And 1359, so 1,359 executions were carried out during that time period. So for now, the trend is downward. In 2013, uh, I don't know what's up with my numbers right now, um, there were 80 death sentences and 39 executions. And 47% of all death row prisoners are in Texas, California, and Florida. Oh, man. That kind of makes sense. 65% of U.S. adults support death penalty in cases of murder. Right? So there are situations where people don't think necessarily they should get the death penalty. But there is this kind of idea in the larger society, I guess. Like I said, a little bit over half there, 65%. That, you know, uh, if a person kills someone else, they deserve to die as well. But if you go back to the different kinds of, um, we're talking about the different types of punishments or justification for societies to punish, that one sounds like retribution, right? <laughs> killing a person for killing a person. Oh, this is like my least favorite part. Okay, so <laughs> um, again, in crim, I talk about this all day and it's awful. But anyway, early research looked into biological causes of crime and a lot of it's super racist, right? And it's conception and what it thought, and what it argued. So first, Lombroso thought that certain physical traits could be associated with criminality. So he called them um, stigmatas, not like the thing where you get like the thing in your hand and it's because like, yeah, like the nails of Jesus or anything. Not that kind of stigmata. He called them stigmata, even though his definition of them changed over time, which is like super scientific. Um, and it weren't very specific, but it was supposed to just be like abnormal facial or bodily features. So like big ears, small ears, big nose, small nose, like any of those things, weird chin, um, that basically if you looked at a person, you found a couple of these criteria, they were what he called atavistic, which meant a throwback to earlier evolution. Like you're just like not a fully evolved person. And of course, he was very racialized, let's just say, in the way that he determined who was a throwback and who wasn't. Um, but yeah, it was basically like, oh, you can just look at a person and tell they're a criminal, right? Sheldon had a very similar kind of idea. You can look at them and tell they're a criminal. But he was looking at the body types of criminals. So he argued that there's three body types. There's the mesomorphs, people that are you know muscular and buff. There's the endomorphs, people that are round or fat. And then there's the ectomorphs, people that are thin or skinny. So he theorized that mesomorphs committed more crimes than any other body type. And the reason for this was he thought they were more aggressive and more prone to risky behaviors. Um, and again, kind of like Lombroso thought that, you know, if you're a big muscular bro dude, they're kind of a slightly a throwback in evolution as well. <laughs> Sorry. Nowadays, we love that. We like try and crossfit the crap out of that, right? But apparently Sheldon, not so much. I'm wondering which one Sheldon was, right, of those three. Anyway. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, expanding on that research with Eleanor Gluck, um, they found that mesomorphs did commit more crimes, but it wasn't their body type that was necessarily causing the criminal behavior. Maybe it was because they were more athletic that made them more independent, so they had more social distance from others, from their parents, they were less sensitive to others, which basically they also thought that people expected them to be bullies, which then became a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? When people kind of expect things of you, you tend to fulfill that expectation. In the 60s, they started looking at genetics and criminal behavior, looking at a link between testosterone and aggression, and found that men who had an extra Y chromosome were more likely to commit violent crimes, like they were testing it on people in prisons. What, again, ugh, that's such a simple thing. Everyone's like, testosterone causes violence, blur. Ugh, science. I just love that, like, there's science, and then there's what in the society we call pseudoscience, which is like a barely grasping knowledge of it that the majority of us have, that we just hear bits and pieces here and there and then try and slap it together. Like, you know, on the news, how they'll be like, 
this is good for you. Oh no, wait, it's going to kill you. Oh no, it's good for you. Like he goes back and forth like every day based on one study, but they don't talk about the study in the context of like other studies and the discipline or what like the general body of knowledge or research looks at, God forbid. So anyway, um, when you actually look at recent research on testosterone aggression, it's found that, te that testosterone has a permissive effect, meaning that it's not necessarily the testosterone causing the aggression. It's the aggression causing more testosterone. It's interesting, like they would, they would do these readings of men, like they'd just be at a normal whatever, and then it would be these men that, you know, were in high power positions at work. So they would do a reading at home, and then they would do a reading when they got to the workplace and find that their testosterone level was much higher when they were in leadership positions or roles where they were being more aggressive. So it's kind of interesting, like, just like any other hormone, it's a chemical that fluctuates, Right in its usage, but it's interesting that it would be related to the other way around. Instead of just saying men are like beasts that just kill because it's their nature, right? Instead of just saying like men are just dumb clods, it's really just saying no, it's actually that the hormones, the chemicals in your body change in response to the environment that you're in, which like we know for sure. Um, so this has had a, had a resurgence recently in the 2000s because of what they call neurocriminology. Um, where they do like brain scans, basically. Um, and again, they're looking for a link between, um, you know, all sorts of this crap, basically. And the thing is that the biological theories don't provide an adequate understanding of criminal behavior, right? They're not actually explaining why it's happening, right? It's like, oh, you're just, because biologically you do it, right? You're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like, neurocriminology-wise, there's this really interesting dude that does brain scans that, um, you know, he was talking about how, um, you know, he was doing this research on all these psychopaths and he'd scan their brains and look at like how they had these anomalies in their frontal lobe. And he was putting it together saying like, wow, how interesting that psychopaths have these anomalies in the areas where you're supposed to be developing like compassion, understanding, you know, like relationships to others. And, um, that somehow if you found that brain pattern, that someone was inherently going to kill people. And then his mother, actually, of all people, was like, hey, now, um, you know, you're not, like, our own history is not innocent. Like, you have some prominent murderers in your family. And he's like, what are you talking about? And he found out, like, his, like, great, great aunt or one of those kind of people was Lizzie Borden, who famously, like, chopped up her family with an axe, right? Oh, God, she, like, chopped her dad in the face, like, a lot of times. But anyway, um, so, and, like, another prominent murderer in his family line and then so he ended up doing a brain scan of himself his family all that stuff and he found out a lot of them had the same brain anomalies meaning that they had they were kind of more sociopaths right <laughs> and so that's when he realized like oh obviously it's not nature or nurture it's both because what's the difference between his brain having that pattern and this guy locked up behind bars for murdering people having that pattern environment Right? He grew up in a loving, supporting home with people setting real boundaries for what was right and wrong versus the people he was interviewing and meeting in prison that grew up in chaotic home environments without a lot of support, without a lot of reassurement of what is right and wrong and those kind of things, that it's easier for someone that's sociopathic to just not connect to other people. So <laughs> when he started expanding his research with this new idea in mind, he started scanning more and more people and you realize that a lot of successful businessmen like CEOs were also psychopaths who also had that brain anomaly so meaning that like <laughs> you know not having compassion is actually a positive thing within our capitalistic system so you know if you're willing to like boost your corporate profits by laying off 10,000 people like for me I couldn't do something like that without it just like destroying my life like all I could think about was like how, what were their families going to do and all of those kind of things um you know, if you're someone that doesn't have that kind of, uh, you know, thought process, then that's not going to bother you. <laughs> so anyway, you know, neurocriminology shows that, yes, there are patterns in our brain, and that's important to study and understand. But what, you know, he ultimately found through some of that research was that, <laughs> you know, uh, and this is in Bardo, that he found that, ironically, you know, it's, it's really much more your environment than the biological aspects. All right. Then there's psychological causes of crime, right? So obviously personality traits play into criminality. So containment theory is kind of part of that too, right? They talk about that a little bit in the book. So, um, you know, for an example, 
that, um, <clears throat> like, I think they, they're talking about that, that, that example in the book, 12 year old boys in the high crime area saw that the teachers identified as good had better behaviors and did not get violent opposed to the bad boys who couldn't control their influences. They argued that the good boys personalities contained their delinquency. So meaning that the assumption is that all these kids are criminal and that only the good ones are just better at hiding it, I guess. So there's a lot of problems with this approach. Many serious crimes are committed by people who are quite normal, who aren't like mentally devious or, or, you know, disturbed, right, or anything of that nature. So psychological theories consider only the individual and also not how society is defining them, right? Identity formation is a complicated process and often has a lot to do with what those outside of you think of you or what you perceive those, of, those outside of you to think of you. So without really examining that, you're kind of missing, like obviously personality is, a, is an important part, but without looking at, you know, how a lot of these people are normal, how does their how do they relate to society? How does society see them as a category? That matters. So structural functional analysis is looking at why society creates crime. So Durkheim argued the functions of crime that crime um, would affirm a society's norms and values. So that recognizing crime helps everyone recognize the line between right and wrong. So people react to crime, and that helps bring them together. He called social cohesion, right? And so he also argued that crime encourages social change because people are like, hey, this is a problem. we got to do something about it, right? So, um, you know, crime is a creation of society, not individuals. And crime is really um, a normal and necessary element of society. It's, that's what structural functionalist analysis argued anyway, is that it's just part of the fabric of society. It's just like they, they see each part of the culture as a puzzle piece that has to fit together for it to function. And they argue that's just one of the pieces. Um, so Merton strain theory looks at this a little bit more in depth. I put the figure on the screen here because I think that helps quite a bit to understand it. So they argue that uh, Merton strain theory argues that uh, crime is a product of society itself. So patterns of rule breaking depend on whether or not people accept society's goals or society provides the opportunity to reach these goals. So, you know, for our culture, what is the goal of society? Money, right? So does society provide the opportunity to reach that goal for everyone? To reach money for everybody? Not equally. Right? So basically, there's five specific outcomes. There's conformity, innovation, ritualism, retreatism, and rebellion. So, you know, on this little graph here, it shows you. So if you accept the goals of society, which is money, and you accept the means, what is the conventional means? Well, technically, most of the people in this class would be in this category because you're going to class because you want a piece of paper where they give you more money for a job, right? You're not trying to go out and rob people for money. You're trying to do it the legitimate way, right? You're trying to do it the way that society says you're supposed to do it. Get a degree, get a better job, make some money. So that would be conformity. Um, for those people that are just unable to, um, you know, they, they still want the goals. They want that money, but they're not able to get it from conventional means. We'll get back to them in a second. Innovators. So then there's people, these ones kind of can be confusing for people. Ritualism. People that reject the goals of society but accept the conventional means, right? So it's not even that they necessarily reject the goals of society. They just know they're never going to have it, right? So these are people that like work two, three jobs, even though uh, like they know they're never going to live in a mansion. They're not trying to be a millionaire, <laughs> right? Um, but they know that they, they're never going to have the goals of society and be super rich, but they still go to work every day. They still try and raise their family. They still try and live a human life. That's the ritualism. So then, yeah, going back to innovation, um, let's say you live in a really low-income area and you don't have an access to education, right? So how likely then are you to be able to get the conventional means, right? What if you live in an area that's economically depressed so it doesn't have any good-paying jobs, how then are you going to use the conventional means 
to get there. So it's not even necessarily rejection in the way that you think of like a like a choice of a rejection, just like for the ritualism. I'm sure all those poor people working in a ritualized way would love to have the money. They just know they won't, right? Rich, or innovation is similar. Like people would love to have a legitimate way to make a lot of money, but if they can't have a legitimate way, they might go to the underground economy, right? They might, you know, do something illegal because that would give them the opportunity to get the goal goals of society, but not through the means that are considered acceptable. So then retreatism is when you re reject the goals and the means, right? So a lot of people would argue that people that are just kind of given up on society or like retreated from the normative society. So people that are like homeless, I guess, or chronically homeless, people that have been like the underclass for a long time, like the people that were living in the riverbed until the city council guy cleared it out. That would be retreatism where you're not planning on being a rich person and you're not trying to achieve it through those goals of society. And then what I think is the most interesting is rebellion down here, right? So rebellion is when you, it's, you make your own means and you make your own goals. So an example of rebellion could be like uh, people live off the grid right? Or like those tiny homes movement, like you see all those HGV t HGTV shows where it's like, this kitchen's too big. And then like the kitchen is like <laughs> ridiculously small. And you're like, what? It's like the size of a trailer for the whole place. Um, that would be rebellion where people are basically saying they don't want the goals of society. They don't want money. What they want is what? Comfort, security, being free, from capitalism. That's why people want those small homes, right? It's so they can pay it off at once and not have to pay a mortgage for the rest of their life, right? I don't think it's inherently because people want to be squished up next to each other all the goddamn time. You know, I think it's because they just don't want to be free from the burden of paying all, all of your horrible life, right? And then, um, you know, those same kind of people that use like alternative means so that they don't have to live on the grid so that they can like provide their own energy, provide their own water, provide their own everything, right? And their means are very different than how other people do these things, right? Like um, communes and things of that nature. So it's interesting. Like rebellion is like, it's not necessarily rejection of the goals and means because it's a completely different goal and means. All right. So um, another issue is opportunity structure. So meaning that becoming a criminal depends on the presence of illegitimate opportunity. So patterns of conformity and criminality depend on people's relative opportunity structure. So kind of just like, do you have more opportunities to, you know, like if you have people that could give you a reference, are they going to give you a reference to, you know, a high paid job? Are they going to give you a reference to a McDonald's job? Like, meaning that if you have, like, you're much more likely to turn to criminology or criminology to criminality if you are relatively, you know, given no opportunities for legitimacy. Um, Hershey argues that social ties discourage crime, meaning that social ties operate to control crime by attach attachment to other people, access to conventional opportunities involvement in conventional activities, and belief in the rightness of cultural norms and values, right? When you have family around you and you have a community around you, you're more, you buy into society more. You accept it more. You're less likely to break rules and do things that are considered, you know, deviant or criminal because, you know, you, you don't want to upset your family. You don't want to upset your community. You don't want to upset those kind of larger things. Okay, so symbolic interactionism looks at a different they're looking at socially constructing reality. So they argue that people learn criminal behavior from their surroundings. And that what is defined as crime and who is defined as a criminal result from a highly variable process of social definition. So like I was saying, a crime is considered more deviant when the person committing it is considered more deviant. Um, so they also look at differential association theory, which argues that learning takes place in social groups and deviance depends on the extent of contact with those who discourage conventional behavior. So meaning like if you are in a peer group that's like a gang, then you're probably not learning the dominant conventional views of society, right? You're learning the, the gang views of society. If you joined a, I don't know, 
like uh, middle class church group, right? Then you're probably dealing with people that that encourage conventional behavior and following laws and those things. So basically, meaning if you're associating with people that don't support social norms, you're going to stop supporting social norms. Um, labeling theory looks at it differently too. And again, these are like snapshots of how these theories actually work, which we talk about way more if you take my crim class. But anyway, um, so labeling, you know, the only real definition of rule breaking is behavior that people label that way. So no, no action is right or wrong in an absolute sense. It's whether or not we consider it to be a crime. And that often has to do with who's doing it. Right. So we can often see this in the way that crimes are considered. You know, if it's a young white person, oh, well, kids will be kids. Kids make mistakes. But if it's a young person of color, you know, this is a dangerous criminal that needs to be locked up. So, you know, the, I, the definition of rule breaking has a lot to do with how we label it. Um, and then this, I, I kind of mentioned this before, primary and secondary deviance, that you know, you're, you're obviously changed by the labels that people apply to your behavior. So primary deviance could be that skipping school, underage drinking, something that's just a minor thing you do. But how people react to that can provoke secondary deviance, which is when you start to base your choices on a deviant identity. Meaning that like, let's say you get in trouble and people are like, wow, you're a bad kid. And the more you get that from people, the more you're like, yeah, I am bad. And you start to identify that way. And you make choices based on that deviant identity. Um, Goffman argued that there's this issue of the power of the stigma, meaning a stigma is a powerful negative social label that changes a person's self-concept and social identity. So once a person is stigmatized, an individual can find that conventional friends are gone, right? They're not going to, like, if you're stigmatized, then you're going to be alone, <laughs> right? Um that a criminal prosecution can be a powerful ritual that stigmatizes the individual. So like, for example, a stigma of the felony label, right? Or being an ex-con, that would be an example. You meet someone, you're like, oh, that person's nice. Yeah, they're cool. Oh yeah, yeah, they're an ex-con. And then people are like, wow, what? What were they in for? What was there whatever? Like, it's this idea that if you were in the system, that follows you forever. And there's a perception and stigma against that person as criminal. Alrighty. So when it comes to social conflict analysis, they're looking at crime and inequality. So obviously Marx was looking at social class and crime, how social problems happened in terms of class conflict, meaning there was this conflict between people that had the means and owned the means of production and those who worked for them and owned nothing. And it was kind of a struggle between those who have and those who don't. So crime is seen as a product of social inequality, meaning that kind of like structure of inequality that means some people don't have opportunities while others have all the opportunities is what's leading to crime. So he argued the solution to the crime problem is to eliminate capitalism for a more egalitarian system and that that will get rid of crime. I don't know if that's actually true, but that would help. <laughs> it would help giving people financial resources would help lift a lot of people out of crimes. Um, but would it necessarily stop like someone that's super psychopathic or a serial killer? No, not necessarily. Okay, so feminist analysis, um, you know, argues that with less access to good jobs and positions of power, some women see crime as a means of coping with their exploitation and as a way to make a living. So police are far more likely to arrest women working as prostitutes than men who pay for sex. This is very different in other cultures um, where the actual sex worker herself has been decriminalized but it is the John or the person paying for sex that is actually criminalized since he's the one that's actually doing something illegal. And so um, not just women who are working within prostitution, but in general in society, women are at a high risk of sexual violence. And part of the problem is that we live in a culture that justifies violence against women, that, you know, sets a social script where women are supposed to be sexually, you know, um, passive and men are supposed to be sexually aggressive that kind of leads to a lot of the normalization of the sexual violence. And um, I think I mentioned to you guys uh, that, that uh, Samantha B clip I'm going to put up for you guys too about the thousands of untested rape kids that sit on prison shelves, I mean prison, in uh, police custody all over this country that are being incinerated because they don't have more space to test them or more money to test them, um, which is insane because obviously we talked about this, how a lot of these people are in codex. If they just ran it, they would know the person's identity, bada boom, bada bing, police work done. 
But instead, it's just not important, right? It's not considered important. So if you're interested in that, watch that Samantha B clip I put up for you guys, and you'll get some more info on that. So anyway, this was the review. Um, hope I caught you up on everything and it wasn't too long-winded. <laughs>